first part, the first this will be the first part, the first part of our lecture on the last 10,000 years, which will cover the origins of agriculture and the Anthropocene. All right, so that'll go into, once we get into that part, we'll talk about global climate change a little bit. All right, so hopefully everyone had a chance to download the concept review questions. If you haven't yet, they are in my most recent announcement on Canvas or also in module eight. I'm gonna go ahead and go here to share screen. Okay. All right, so this will correlate with chapter 15 and chapter 16 in the explorations textbook. So if you haven't done that already, please make sure you go ahead and read that, those two chapters. All right, so we are now in the period of time that we know as the agricultural or the Neolithic revolution. So essentially we know that the last ice age ended approximately 10 to 11,000 years before present. So as the last ice age ended, obviously the climate became warmer and more stable. Um, but somewhat more importantly, as the climate became warmer and more stable, that allowed for carbon dioxide levels to rise, which allowed for increased plant productivity and plant cultivation. So plants um, take in carbon dioxide, sunlight, and water, and they then produce oxygen for us. So we have this nice symbiotic relationship with plant life. This is considered to be a pretty fundamental threshold in the evolution of humanity. Because um, the vast majority of time, you know, we've, we've gone through six million years of human evolution over the past few weeks. Um, but essentially, the vast majority of time, humans have been practicing hunting and gathering as their primary mode of subsistence, their primary mode of getting food. And they were largely nomadic. So they were, they were following the migration routes of game and also the seasonality of the various plants that they were cultivating or gathering, I should say, in this case. It's really just been a blip in time, the last you know, 10, 11,000 years that humans have started to domesticate and control the growth patterns of both plants and animals. So um, we'll talk about in this unit, we'll talk about, uh, there are some, there is some debate about whether or not this was the correct decision for humans. Um, some theorists would claim that this is the worst mistake that humans ever made as far as survivability goes. and survivability of the planet, because we can see that environmental degradation is well documented and um, really began around this time frame. This is when we started living in sedentary villages. This is when we started to acquire property and land ownership. Um, this is where we start to see the emergence of competition for access to resources, um, because obviously when we're talking about cultivating plants, not all land is created equal. Some land is more fertile and um, provides more nutrients for the plants that we wish to cultivate. So we will see that um, the agricultural or Neolithic revolution begins in a region called the Fertile Crescent, what we know now essentially as the Middle East. Um, so essentially why did humans decide to adopt agriculture? So a lot like when we looked at the question, why did humans decide to um, transition or why did evolution select for humans to transition to bipedalism and move away from arboreal and quadrupedal forms of locomotion. You know, obviously that, that transition took millions of years. Um, this transition took thousands. Um, you know, we do see that the very earliest um, agriculturalists were doing both. They didn't necessarily transition from hunting and gathering to sedentary agriculture overnight. Uh, most of the early agriculturalists were still doing both. They were um, living, they were occupying sedentary villages during part of the season or part of the year, and then still engaging in some, and some nomadic hunting and gathering at the same time. So the very earliest agriculturalists were doing both. We'll talk about the Natufians and what that transition looked like for them. All right, so early hunter-gatherers, hunter-gatherers in the early Holocene, that's essentially the last 10,000 years, are still mainly nomadic. Uh, they're moving seasonally, following the migration patterns of the game animals that they're hunting. And they're also, of course, following the seasonality of the plants that they're, that they're gathering. Um, but we do see in the early Neolithic, we see the occupation of temporary villages. And then eventually we start to see evidence for the occupation of year-round villages. So this term Neolithic or agricultural revolution, when you hear that term, you think of something sudden, something dramatic. But it may not have been as sudden or dramatic as once thought, because we're seeing a lot of evidence that this transition took place gradually 
And it happened possibly in different ways um, in the various places around the globe where you see it emerge. So it's, you know, I want you to start thinking of it as a gradual transition, a gra gradual transition from nomadic hunting and gathering to sedentary plant and animal cultivation. Uh, but there's definitely going to be some um, dramatic changes in the evolution of humans that we see over the last 10,000 years, which you, when you really think about it is a very small time frame. You know, we've been looking at human evolution over the last 6 million years. Um, no, now we're just talking about the last 10 or 11,000, where we see some pretty dramatic changes. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit today about the positive and negative consequences of this transition. So the transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture did allow for a more reliable food source. Um, we, especially once humans got better at it and figured out exactly how to cultivate and encourage the features, the characteristics and plants that are the most advantageous for us as far as um, feeding our population. So both plants and animals, we started to learn how to selectively breed and selectively um, bring out those characteristics that we wanted. And of course, 10,000 years ago, we weren't necessarily using hormones or antibiotics to encourage the, the kind of features that we wanted. But, you know, even in the early days, um, early agriculturalists certainly recognized that if they bred the features that they wanted, they would, uh, that would yield crops that were more plentiful and animals that were more easily domesticated. So the positive the positive consequences, essentially a more reliable food source. Uh, they were able to create a food surplus when humans were hunting and gathering. It wasn't advantageous for them to carry around a bunch of food with them. It was more advantageous for them to just take what they needed for in that moment, or maybe at the very most for a day or two. It wasn't advantageous for them to carry around, you know, weeks or months worth of food with them. Uh, but once humans started practicing agriculture, they had a more reliable way of producing food and they were able to create a food surplus. Um, this allowed for a more sedentary lifestyle. Now, when I say sedentary, um, I don't mean that they're sitting around all day watching TV or being lazy. I mean, more sedentary in comparison to when they were covered, when they were traveling seven, eight miles a day just to gather food. So sedentary lifestyle just means in comparison to what we saw with the nomadic hunting and gathering lifestyle. Okay, so along with this, so those three top factors, reliable food source, food surplus, and a more sedentary lifestyle, allowed for shorter birth intervals. So that's the term that we've covered many times in this class. So birth interval just means the period of time between subsequent births, between birth A, birth B, birth C, so on and so forth. So you may recall way back in the human adaptation chapter, we talked about uh, the Kalahari uh, Bushmen. And that their, their particular reproductive strategy is to have a longer period of time between births because uh, the women in that community have very high caloric demands. They're traveling seven, eight miles a day just to gather enough food for survival. They're also practicing on-demand breastfeeding. So it's not advantageous for those women to try to have um, you know, a newborn, a two-year-old, a four-year-old, a six-year-old. That would be um, way too much stress on that mother. So for the for the Kalahari Bushmen, it's way more advantageous for them to space out their burrs for five, possibly even six years apart. So they can really invest a great deal in that one offspring. Um, so in comparison, once humans started living in sedentary villages and practicing um, domesticated food, domesticated plants and animal production, having a reliable food source, it allowed them over time to gradually shorten those birth intervals. Because the caloric demands on the females are not as high if they're not traveling as far just to gather food. You know, they're still practicing on-demand breastfeeding. They're still having infants that are extremely dependent upon them for survival. So they're still not having a birth every year, but they may be having a birth every two to three years instead of every four to five years like they were when they were hunting and gathering, which may not sound like a huge deal. Uh, but if you're looking at the entire community and you're looking at them having you know, maybe five or six children over the span of their reproductive years instead of two or three, then that could, does have the potential to increase the population size. So that kind of brings us to the negative impacts. Um, 10,000 years ago, a population increase wasn't necessarily a huge deal. Uh, 
Um, but over the last 10,000 years, we have increased our population size to over eight and a half billion people. So I think many of us can, can experience and, and agree that um, we have possibly exceeded the carrying capacity in our current environment. Uh, I'm not saying in all regions around the globe, um, but certainly in those um, suburban and urbanized regions, Los Angeles, for example, we could certainly agree that there are more people living in Los Angeles than we can provide food for. Um, so obviously that's, you know, talking about a recent example, but population explosion has definitely been one of the negative consequences as, as far as survival of the species and survival of the planet. Now, of course, I think the planet will be fine. I think that, um, you know, what we really need to discuss is whether or not we will be fine, uh, because I think that's one of the number one issues that's facing us today is essentially just too many people on the planet to properly feed, house, and provide the sustenance that they need to live happy, plentiful lives. Um, so along with the negative issues, um, sanitation issues. So when we're talking 10,000 years ago, when humans are transitioning from hunting and gathering to sedentary agriculture, um, they don't necessarily know yet that they need to properly dispose of both human and animal waste to avoid the spread of infectious diseases. So in the beginning, just quite simply, the fact that they were having to deal with these concerns was certainly an issue. So they're having to all of a sudden figure out how to properly dispose of waste and to also, of course, keep their food and water away from anything that could contaminate it. All right, also nutritional issues. So when you think about it, a hunting and gathering lifestyle is really, as far as nutrition goes, pretty ideal because hunters and gatherers eat a really diverse, wide dietary, wide, wide, wide amount of dietary items, essentially a wide dietary breath is what I'm looking for there. So they're, you know, hunter gatherers are eating vegetation, fruit, insects, some degree of meat. They're eating anything they can get their hands on. Whereas these sedentary agriculturalists, they're focusing in on just um, a lot of grain, a lot of carbohydrates. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not still occasionally um, gathering and hunting, but they're focusing in pretty heavily on carbohydrate rich diets. So um, that led to some nutritional issues in the beginning. Um, we see in the beginning, we'll talk about this later, but there's a high incidence of iron deficiencies, high incidence of stature or height decreasing, which is a big indicator of nutritional deficit. And um, we also start to see dental caries or cavities and lots of, lots of, is lots of issues with our dentition around the Neolithic transition. So we'll talk about that later, but definitely we see um, evidence in the skeleton and evidence in the dentition that, at least in the beginning, the transition to agriculture wasn't completely positive as far as nutrition goes. Um, infectious diseases began to spread more rapidly. So disease is what we like to call a density-dependent factor. So if you're living in a sedentary village and you're living in very close proximity to your neighbors, it's much more likely that if one of you gets sick, you're going to pass it along to everyone else. And um, we all learned that with the, our most recent pandemic that, you know, one of our biggest ways of combating it was to essentially um, quarantine in our homes because, um, you know, the more we're around other people that might potentially have this virus, the more likely it is to spread to us. Um, but that's, you know, that be began, you know, 10,000 years ago when we started living in much more close, um, in, in closer quarters and in close contact with one another. Um, social inequality. Um, so that may not be something you immediately think of when you think of the transition to agriculture. Um, but this is really the first time that it became advantageous for humans to acquire property and land ownership. So, um, you know, that there began to be this difference between the haves and the have nots. It was, you know, essentially the time frame where humans started to compete for access to the most plentiful and resourceful land, the land that was the most, um, that provided the most nutrients for growing crops, that's near a water source, um, land that's in regions that would allow the animals that they're domesticating to feed properly. So we start to see the emergence of leaders, we start to see the emergence of violence and competition. Um, not that competition didn't exist before, it certainly did, competition existed when we were hunting and gathering as well. Um, but essentially competition is increasing. Competition for access to resources is, is increasing. 
because we're now competing over limited sources, limited resources, and population size is, is population size is growing. All right, questions so far. Okay, so along with this, along with um, the growing population size, along with sedentary villages and land ownership and the emergence of leaders, we see the emergence of social complexity. Um, we know that complex social networks do not develop in isolation. They emerge as networks. Um, they require much more complex social organization. So we start to see the emergence of leaders or what, they, what you may hear call as aggrandizers. Um, we see the origin of inequality and property ownership. We start to see intergroup conflict over access to the highest quality land and resources. There's evidence that conflict sometimes escalated into warfare. Um, so we see a higher incidence of evidence of violence in the fossil record around this time frame. Um, we also see alliance formation as trade networks emerged. So maybe one group was really good at growing barley and another group was really good at growing wheat. And then another group was really good at domesticating um, goats, for example. So if they all can trade with one another, then they can all benefit from um, from from essentially those food sources. So it's it became advantageous for human groups, human societies to trade with one another, to form alliances, and to cooperate. Because even though um, humans may compete, essentially we are very social. Uh, we have essentially very low levels of sexual dimorphism, which means that as a primate, we tend to be um, far more cooperative in comparison to our relatives that have high levels of sexual dimorphism. And so also we're going to start to see, um, since we have more leisure time now, we're not spending every waking hour trying to gather enough food for survival and raise our children we have more time for things like creating crafts and symbolic expression. So around this time frame and the time frame leading up to it, we see the emergence of um, things like cave art and statuettes and jewelry. Not that we didn't see it before, even in the time of the Neanderthals, we see some evidence for cave art and symbolic expression, jewelry and makeup kits. But we cer certainly see an increase or an uptick in symbolic expression once we get to about 30 to 40,000 years before present in Europe and about 30 to 50,000 years before present in Australia. So in Europe and Africa, we tend to see depictions of animals that these humans were hunting. So it could have been a way of a ritual to create a successful hunt. In Australia, we tend to see more um, anthropomorphic type figures, which are stick figure drawings of, of creatures that are kind of half animal and half human. So um, this could be, and we know from studying modern day Australian Aboriginal populations, that these are likely depicting that spirit world connection, that primordial time um, called the dreaming time. So the dreaming time in Australian Aboriginal culture is a primordial time when the world was, was first being formed. And the spirits alive during the dreaming created features of the landscape and all human beings. So this was, you know, studying the Australian Aborigines and other, um, other populations, other origin, other populations where we look at the origins of spirituality and the origins of religion is quite interesting to me because, you know, they quite literally believed that their ancestors created everything around them, the mountains, the streams, the rivers, the oceans, which, you know, when they lose a loved one, they, they feel that their loved one is still all around them because they become part of the earth again. And that also creates an ultimate respect for the environment and everything around them because they quite literally believe that their ancestors are still a part of it. So, um, you know, it's interesting as we as we go into what we're facing in modern day with global climate change and the destruction of the environment. You know, maybe these these origins, the origins of spirituality and religion, got it a little bit more correct. That you know, maybe this belief that our ancestors created the world creates a much more um, a much more harmonious interaction with it. We're much more inspired to protect the world around us when we believe our ancestors quite literally created it. Just a thought, just something to think about as we, as we delve into some of the global climate change topics later on in this unit.
All right, symbolic expressions. We, we just see more and more examples of this. Um, this is Chauvet Cave in France, which obviously is before the Neolithic Revolution. But, you know, I like to put this, you know, these slides here because it kind of gives you a visual example of what we're starting to see. And we're just starting to see more and more solid, concrete examples of humans expressing themselves in symbolic and ritualistic manners. So this is a lot of depictions of animals that early humans, early homo sapiens, possibly Neanderthals were, were hunting and relying upon as a primary food source. This is another image of the Hall of, Hall of Bulls in France. So we're getting a little closer to the Neolithic revolution here. This one's dated about 12,000 to 17,000 years before present. Just another, another image of the Hall of Bulls in France. 12,000 to 17,000 years before present. And we also start to see figurines. Um, Venus figurines are found in many regions throughout the old world. And it's interesting because they're all, they're all a little bit different, but they're all very similar. They all tend to depict a, a, a curvaceous and voluptuous woman figure, female figure. So there's many interpretations of what that might represent. Does it represent fertility? Does it represent pregnancy? Is it possibly an erotic representation? Is it a self-portrait? Or maybe all of those things. But it is interesting that um, we see similar examples of these Venus figurines throughout the old world and were likely created by completely different groups of hominids, possibly even some by the Neanderthals. So it's interesting to, to look at these figurines and see that they have a similar structure. So there's just some more examples. That's the Venus of Willendorf. That's a very famous one and the Venus of Blasenpoi. So these are obviously before the Neolithic revolution, but it's just giving you some more examples of the various forms, the various ways that humans are expressing themselves symbolically. Um, these are Neolithic plastered skulls. So these are within the Neolithic. So these are actual human skulls that they plastered over and the eyes are shell beads. And of course, pottery. Now, this one actually is, you know, artistic and it has a purpose as well. As we started practicing agriculture and, you know, living in sedentary villages, it all of a sudden became necessary to store grain, to store grain and also to carry water. So the thing about grain is you have to keep it dry because especially if you're trying to save that grain for you know several months or possibly even a year, um, you have to keep that grain, grain dry so it doesn't get moist and invaded by bacteria and fungus. Um, so this pottery is the perfect apparatus to keep grain dry and to store it. And of course, you can also use pottery to carry water from from the running stream up to where you up to where your family is living in the village. So um, pottery not only is artistic, but it also serves a function. All right, so questions so far? Any questions? Feeling good? Okay. All right. So there's various scenarios that are debated when we're talking about the origins of agriculture and this transition from hunting and gathering to a sedentary agricultural lifestyle. So, and it's very possible, like, you know, when we talked about the hypotheses on modern human origins or the hypotheses on bipedalism, it's certainly very possible that both of these scenarios are partially correct. And it's certainly possible that, um, that, that this transition happened in slightly different ways, depending on where we're talking about, on, you know, in the globe geographically. Uh, so scenario one is basically saying that a larger population size came first and created the necessity to create a more um, reliable and plentiful food source. So essentially a large population size created the need for human, human groups to intensify their subsistence in order to survive. So it's saying that, you know, we were trying to feed more mouths and it created the necessity to do something, do, to subsist in a way that created more food than just hunting and gathering. So the need to create a surplus and store food for times of shortage. Um, scenario two, in my mind, is the more likely one and the one that has more support in the archaeological and the fossil record. So it's saying that agriculture came first and the population explosion came later. So essentially, the transition from hunting and gathering to sedentary agriculture allowed for us to have a more sedentary lifestyle. 
which in time allowed for us to shorten our birth interval. So essentially having a child every two to three years instead of every four to five years. And this also provided a more reliable food, sor food source and allowed us to eventually have food surplus. So this ultimately, those factors, the sedentary lifestyle, reliable food source, food surplus, shorter birth intervals, those factors ultimately resulted in a larger population size over time. So it's kind of, you know, the what came first argument, the chicken or the egg. But, you know, in my mind, scenario two is a little bit more likely, uh, but it's certainly possible that it happened in slightly different ways in different regions of the old world. All right. So regardless of what came first, you know, the, the end, the end result was a larger population size. So essentially a larger population size created population pressure, you know, thinking way back to the very beginning of the semester when we talked about the idea of the carrying capacity, that the resources in, a, in an environment will be on a more steady, steady, steady line like this when you're looking at the graph. And then the population size, if it exceeds, if it grows exponentially and exceeds the carrying capacity or essentially the number of organisms that that environment can support, then that's when organisms start to compete. That's when we start to have situations where organisms are competing for access to resources, access to land, access to territory. Not that they didn't compete before, but you know now that there's more limited resources due to a large population size, that competition has has increased. Um, so we definitely see regional variation. We see that plant domestication occurred in at least 10 to 11 regions around the old world, you know, during that time frame, during, you know, about 11,000 to about 8,000 years ago. All right, so we're going to watch a little film clip. Um, I like this film clip. It's a little bit dated at this point, but I like it because it does a really nice job of kind of giving you a visual representation of what it might look like, what it might have looked like and felt like if you were living during that time frame where humans were transitioning from nomadic hunter gatherers to sedentary agriculturalists, and likely doing a little bit of both in those beginning stages. Um, so let's go ahead and exit out here. And I'm gonna pull up. I got it pulled up already. Oh, I do. Okay, so this is from a larger series um, called The Stone Age. It's a historical story from the Stone Age. There's, I think, 15 parts. I'm just going to show you a couple parts today. Uh, but this first one is just about nine minutes, and it's going to talk about that time frame, the very beginning stage. So I want you to think about, you know, what must it have looked like and felt like to live during the Neolithic, during the beginning stages of that transition. And also I want you to think about the Natufians. So it's gonna talk about the Natufians in this little segment here. So think about um, what are the elements of their lifestyle? What would it have felt like and looked like to be a Natufian? Let me make sure I got the volume up for you guys. Oh yeah, let's turn up. All right, here we go. They are hunter-gatherers. They travel light, their children with them, one meal away from starvation. They are never able to settle down. But these nomads are about to change the world. Their Stone Age revolution will make our civilization possible. They will set humanity on the long journey to the modern world. Fifteen thousand years ago, the climate began to change. The glaciers melted, and with water, the world came back to life. One of the best places for humans to live now was an area of the Middle East we call the Fertile Crescent, from Israel to Iraq. The hills were dotted with trees, which spread quickly as the weather improved. The open woodlands were like a garden, supporting a new range of edible plants. Animals flourished on the uplands and fertile plains. <laughs> 
It was a hunter-gatherer's paradise. It was here that traveling bands found something completely new, which would change humanity forever. They discovered a huge family of plants, the grasses. It was a vast supply of grain. This was the spark which would make human progress possible. The evidence is scattered in valleys across the Fertile Crescent. These people left no recorded language or stories. All the archaeologists can do is dig. In the 1920s, the first great woman archaeologist, Dorothy Garrod, carried out excavations around Mount Carmel in Israel. She was looking in caves she thought had been used 50,000 years earlier. Instead, she unearthed the body of a man buried around 12,000 years ago. He was curled up, wearing a beautifully crafted headband decorated with pipe-like seashell. It was so distinctive Garrett believed she had discovered a new people. She named them the Natufians. As she kept digging, she found something researchers had never seen before. It was a tool with a bone handle. It held a line of sharp flint blades. They were coated with a shiny residue, traces of a wild grass, an ancient form of wheat. It was a sickle, a tool designed especially for cutting grass. So Dorothy Garrett knew the Natufians were collecting the new grass foods in large quantities. At the same time each year, these ancient people would have found the ripening grass in huge areas. Many of them were not edible, but they managed to select all the useful species. Now they had barley and wheat. travelers, working together in small family groups. They had to carry everything they harvested. This burden would ultimately change their way of life. Today, the land of the Natufians is drier and hotter. The past is waiting to be discovered just beneath a forbidding surface. Here, at Wadi Hama, in northern Jordan, the Natufians left minute traces of their lives. Archaeologist Philip Edwards has found evidence that these nomads had everything they needed in one place. They're well placed here. They're on water and they are positioned uh, between the lowlands of the Jordan Valley and the uplands of the Mediterranean hills behind. In fact, the Jordan Valley, when the Natufian people were here, was filled by a lake, Lake Lausanne, which uh, extended right up and right past the scene here. 
and looking over that we, we would see if it was a clearer day Mount Carmel peeping out on the coast, the site where the Natufian was discovered originally by Dorothy Garrod. Archaeologists estimate there were no more than a thousand families living in the whole of Israel and Jordan at the time. There was enough grain to feed them well. And it was all growing wild. Now archaeologists have experimented in harvesting wild cereals in their natural area in the Middle East. And what they found is that one person harvesting for a period of about three weeks can produce enough food to feed a family of four for a whole year. These ancient grasses are the forerunners of modern crops. The grains discovered by the Natufians still feed more than half the world's population today. Of all the things they ate, grain was unique in one vital way. It did not decay. Keep it dry, and it lasts for decades. For the first time, they had food they could rely on for long periods of time. Now, they needed to store their grain. There was a reason to stay in one place. This was the first time in the Middle East we know people built shelters to last from year to year. And they remained here from generation to generation down the centuries. They chose their sites carefully. Many had low stone walls. Their remains can be found all... All right. So I like that particular little clip because it gives you a good visualization of what it might have looked like and felt like to be one of those very first agricultural, a member of one of those very first agricultural populations. So Dorothy Garrett named them the Natufians. So the region that we're talking about here is the Fertile Crescent. Let me get a picture for you guys here. Okay, so when we say the Fertile Crescent, um, it gets its name because it's kind of this, so the region in the purple is the Fertile Crescent. So it's kind of a crescent-shaped region, which is mainly what we know of now as Northern Africa and the Middle East. Um, so we will find that this region during that time frame was extremely fertile, meaning that the soil was fertile, and also, interestingly enough, meaning that there was animals that were easily domesticated living in these regions. Um, you know, one of our discussions, not for this week, but I think your final discussion next week, we'll look at um, a documentary called Guns, Germs, and Steel, and we'll look at Jared Diamond's hypothesis on the origins of inequality. So what he found is that this region, the Fertile Crescent, is not only a region where it was um, where it was ideal circumstances to grow crops it was also ideal circumstances to domesticate animals all right so animal domestication started with the dog about fifteen thousand years ago um, of course you know we're all going based on evidence in the fossil record i think it's very possible that dogs were domesticated far sooner than that or far earlier in our history than that possibly even around the time that the neanderthals were still here uh, but we're based on information that we have in the fossil records. So we see um, there is a burial of a Natufian with a dog. Um, so this is where we're getting this information that, you know, essentially around 15,000 years ago, we had pretty solid evidence that humans had domesticated the dog by then. Or that they domesticated us a little bit too, or maybe it was something a little bit more symbiotic. Um, so what can you guys think of any reasons why would it be beneficial for humans to domesticate dogs or vice versa? Well, 
in evolutionary terms, why is it beneficial to have dogs around us? So of course, you know, the obvious is protection and companionship. It allows that they, they possibly were helping us when we were hunting as well. So they could have possibly helped us when we're hunting. Um, we also help them by providing them with a reliable food source. Yep, hunting is a great one, Carla, nice work. Um, protection, so if we're encountering um, other groups of humans or um, you know other animals that may be a threat of a threat to us, the dog would help protect us. And of course, com companionship. Um, we also know um, only 14 animal species have been really successfully domesticated. And interestingly enough, they're all from Northern Africa and the Middle East. So in that region that we know as the Fertile Crescent. Um, so we're gonna watch one more clip that's gonna be more focused on animal domestication. So as you're watching this, think about the symbiotic relationships and not just why it's beneficial to us to domesticate these animals, but why is it potentially a little bit beneficial for them as well. Now, of course, in modern day, when we're looking at you know the way that we practice um, eating meat in modern day, it's certainly quite different. But what I'm asking you to think of is you know what it looked like you know, around the Neolithic Revolution. All right, so one more clip, and then we'll talk about it. All right, so this one, this is episode six from this particular series, and it's going to focus in more on animal domestication. So we'll watch that, and then we're going to do a little bit of work in our breakout rooms. On the human journey. So Twelve thousand years ago, early Europeans lived a hard life in nomadic bands. It was a way of life that had lasted for a hundred thousand years. Sheltering deep in their caves, they painted images of wild animals they hunted for food. For hundreds of generations, they had followed the herds, depending on them for survival. challenge started here on the green hills of the Middle East. Unlike Europe, the climate of the Fertile Crescent produced abundant food all the way from Israel to Iraq. Here, the hunter-gatherers lived very well, and they had learned to hunt with dogs. Dogs have been sitting in the sun with people for at least 12,000 years. They're our oldest companions on the human journey. So close, we're not even sure whether we tamed them or they tamed us. Dogs were a part of life and death. Inside a hut at Ein Malacha, in Israel, archaeologists found a woman buried 11,000 years ago under the floor. 
Beside her head was a puppy. Whoever covered them took the trouble to place the woman's hand over the dog's body. The Ain Malaha burials and the dogs really signal a shift in that human relationship between what had been a wild species, maybe an adversary, uh, and now which is something that had become part of daily life and as a matter of fact even something um, that merits burial with the dead. Uh, and that's a big shift indeed. The dogs were even more attracted to humans once they built huts. Dog domestication comes with human sedentism, with people settling down and creating trash heaps and so on that, that are a lure and an attractant to the dogs. But it does set some sort of a precedence of bringing animals from the wild closer in to that human sphere of life. The relationship with dogs must have set people thinking. Why not control other animals? It would provide a ready supply of meat and cut down on the hunting. But it took a crisis to push them forwards. The Middle East was hit with over a thousand years of drought. It was caused by a short ice age called the Younger Dryas, which brought glaciers to Europe and famine to the Fertile Crescent. It was a climate catastrophe. Deep in the sand and suffering, the hunters changed their way of life. Some people escaped to the few oases with water and good soil. Here, they learnt to plant crops and became the world's first farmers. Others searched desperately for game across their traditional hunting lands. But the drought made the animals scarce. To save themselves, they took possession of their prey. The fireplaces of these hunters reveal the bones of goats, which were kept in herds. They were the very first domesticated farm animals. Archaeologist Melinda Zader is tracking the way goats changed as they were domesticated. Her evidence comes from a huge collection of bones gathered from across the entire Middle East. The changes are most obvious in the horns. You can see on this big guy here from the highlands of Iran, a wild bezoar goat. Um, he's got a very large horn. It's a sharply keeled. It's rounded um, in its sort of profile here. It's, and it goes back in, a, in a, what they call a scimitar shape. And this is very distinctive of the, of the wild goat. It's quite different from what we see in this fellow here, this domestic goat, where it's, the horn is now flattened on the inside, it's twisted, and it, obviously it's quite a bit smaller. Now the reason for that is that in the wild, this kind of a horn gives the males a competitive advantage in competing for females. In the domestic situation, the males aren't competing for females, but the herder is selecting who breeds with whom. So there's really no need for this large equipment. Today in the Middle East, people are still herding goats in the same way. The first herders selected smaller and less aggressive animals, removing the very trays the animals needed to survive in the wild. In return, the herders provided food and protection. They soon added other animals to their herds. This one small part of the world supplied almost all our domesticated species. Alongside goats and sheep were pigs. This pottery figure from Turkey is 8,000 years old. Cows were early beasts of burden. <laughs> 
We tend to look at domestication of animals as a big lose-lose situation for the animals. But really, from a Darwinian perspective, it's a big win-win, because domestic animals, through their uh, collaboration with humans, are able to outcompete their wild progenitors. For the humans, uh, obviously, they're obtaining resources, either plant or animal. It may not be as nutritious or even as necessarily as bountiful a diet as they were getting from hunting and gathering. But there is an element of security and predictability that this kind of resource provides. For the herders, it was a brilliant idea. By keeping the animals alive and breeding them, they guaranteed the supply of meat. The long drought of the Ice Age ended around 11,500 years ago. The world came back to life. Now, something truly remarkable happened. Two distinct ways of surviving, the herders and the cereal farmers, came together. They each had half of the puzzle. The herders had the animals, while the farmers were growing grain to feed the stock. For the first time in history, a ready supply of meat was brought together with cereals. Now the farming way of life was complete. All right. So I want to spend a little bit of time in our breakout rooms today because I know we haven't done that in a few sessions. So let me go here and pause our recording. So in your breakout sessions, I want you to um, help each other out with your concept review questions. Uh, make sure that you've gotten 